Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of our uh, panelists and all of our guests today. My name is Haley Mayer, and I'm the program coordinator for elected officials to protect America, and I'm going to be your host today. And in light of the dual crisis of rising energy prices, along with the cascade of climate impacts that we've seen, like heat waves, droughts, and wild wildfires, we must demand immediate action for the health and well being of all Californians. And that's why elected officials to protect America, California, is asking Governor Newsom to end all fossil fuel permitting to stop fueling the climate crisis, which also fuels war. And elected officials to protect America, California also says that to achieve clean energy economic progress, SB 1020, the Clean Energy Jobs and Affordability Act, must pass, uh, making investments in clean energy a reality for California. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel of distinguished guest speakers for today. And first we have uh, Igor Tregoub, former Berkeley Rent Stabilization Board member, chair of the California Democratic Party Environmental Caucus, and a member of elected officials to protect America Leadership Council. He is also um, an immigrant of Ukraine, so the current events are very personal to him. Uh, next we have uh, Dan Kalb, Oakland, California council member and immediate past chair of the East Bay Community Energy Board. We also have Alex Walker Griffin, the vice mayor of Hercules, California, as well as Heidi Harmon, the former mayor of San Luis Obispo and current senior public affairs director of the Romero Institute's Let's Get Green California. And she's also a part of elected officials to protect America California Leadership Council. And last but not least, we have Maricel Rubio, the Vice President of Dublin San Ramon Water District Board. And thank you all for taking the time to be with us today and sharing the work that you've been doing to fight the climate crisis. So first, I'd like to invite Council Member Kalb to tell us about the work that he's been doing in Oakland. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, and on one hand, it's, I'm sorry that we have to be here. Uh, we shouldn't have to have a bunch of local elected officials come together to say things that folks in Sacramento already know are important. But nevertheless, there's a lot of good work happening in our state. California has been a leader uh, uh, in, the, in terms of combating the climate crisis. With AB 32 passed over 16 years ago, uh, the state's renewable portfolio standard and other uh, clean transportation efforts California is probably doing more than most states in terms of uh, being a leader in the climate crisis. And since California is a, the fifth largest economy in the world, larger than most countries around the world, what we do in California not just is a, a model or can could also just be not only a model for other states and communities, but can be a model for other countries. But that model has to be as strong as possible. And we're not quite there yet. Uh, with fossil fuels being the dominant source of heat trapping greenhouse gas emissions in our state, in our country, in the world, uh, that continue to drive the climate crisis, local elected officials from across California are saying that we must accelerate our transition to a clean energy economy and become essentially energy independent and be a true leader in combating the climate crisis. Again, we could build on the good work that our state has done, but we have to do that. We can't just rest on our laurels and say, well, we're doing enough and that's it. As we know, the IPPC, International Panel, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, uh, which, which says that nations, including subnational governments, need to accelerate their plans to transition off of fossil fuels to retain any hope of reducing the most serious impacts of climate change uh, on our planet. And if we take the time, it's time now, and if we do that, to accelerate our transition off our dependency on dirty fossil fuels, we'll be able to improve our environment, improve the health of our residents, uh, and in many cases, actually save money uh, for, our, for our communities and our, our residents. As the fifth largest economy in the world, our state lawmakers need to push forward on the opportunity to pass SB 1020. I believe it's by Senator Laird from the uh, uh, Santa Cruz area, the Clean Energy Jobs and Affordable Affordability Act of 2022, which will help enhance our climate goals, protect workers, 
and ensure that California continues to be a global climate leader. To take immediate action, we, at, we are asking, elected officials from up and down the state are urging our good governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, to stop issuing any new permits for fossil fuel uh, development and, <clears throat> and urge the passage and then sign SB 1020 when it gets to his desk. Um, <clears throat> I, I wanna say a, a little bit about the California Air Resources Board. I was very involved in the AB 32 battle uh, to create that law and the, and the first scoping plan that came from that, uh, that which outlines the climate actions that will happen or are supposed to happen in our state. Um, AB uh, CARB, the California Air Resources Board, was given broad decision-making authority under AB2, uh, AB32 in order to minimize the political pressures in the climate scoping plan decision-making process so we can adopt and implement strong climate actions. So I have to say, while CARB has done some good work and there are some good elements in the, in the latest scoping plan, I am disappointed that what appears to be that CARB would let the very pressures that they are supposed to be insulated from lead them to propose what I think is an insufficient plan, which may have some good elements, but an insufficient plan that clearly needs to be strengthened before it's adopted. CARB must adjust their scoping plan to reflect the needs of all of us up and down the state and realize that their job, their job one, is to make sure that the scoping plan is implemented and that it, it can be done, so, be done in a manner that has the actions necessary to truly achieve the emission reductions that we have to achieve to be a leader in our country and around the world. We're not quite there yet. We urge CARB to take stronger action and we urge the, leg urge the legislature to pass SB 1020 and get that bill to the governor's desk as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Cobb. That's a lot of great issues that you are pointing out. Um, there's a lot of eyes on California right now uh, across the country, but also globally. And California does have the potential to lead the way in uh, renewable energy. And um, that potential is there. We just need to act on it. And next, I would like to go to the Vice Mayor of Hercules, Alex Walker Griffin, to um, tell us about the work that he has done. Yes, thank you, Haley, and thank you, Councilmember Cal. It's good to hear, it's good to see you again and see all my friends again. And just to chime on what he says, you know, so goes California, so goes the country. And I think in recent years, especially under the Brown administration, that has been really the case. Uh, I was elected in 2020 at the age of 23, and being a 1997 baby, I'm a part of Generation Z. And I like to say that Generation Z is the generation that gets nothing but bad news. We got student loans, we got climate crisis, we're going to hit another recession again. So it seems like every time I turn around, my generation gets faced with something new, which is why this issue is so important to me. I moved out of my mom's place a while back and I lived relatively close to one of our Safeway gas stations. And it, it was right, right when the whole conflict in Ukraine began that I one day was just looking out the window and I saw the gas prices rising. It was probably about 11 o'clock at night. And coincidentally, moments later, this commercial came on TV talking about energy independence. And that just made me think, I was like, are we really independent when we know we have this inelastic commodity of oil that we rely so heavily on? And it made me frustrated to know that there are people out there who are trying to do the work, all the work that they can to make sure that we stay back and don't move forward with renewable energy and new opportunities for a greener tomorrow. Listen, we all know that the past two years, people have been feeling the pain in their wallets, they've been feeling the pain at home, the mental stress, the mental stress, and this is just one more obstacle that people are facing. And we all know, this is another thing too, we've been paying more for gas, and these companies have been giving less out, making record profits. You can't tell me these past couple of months haven't been Christmas for them. And obviously, they're not trying to share what they've been giving because cash prices just continue to rise, right? This means that we have to do more to make sure that we can combat that and at the same time, put ourselves in a new platform. But the problem is here at the local level, jurisdictions can sometimes struggle based on the will of their own body. Here in Hercules, we were able to pass our electrification ordinance, meaning that any new development has to be 100% electric. The challenge that I faced when I introduced that was the entire way I faced opposition from two council members. So out of the five of us, only three of us supported the idea from start to finish. And we know that every single community is different, which is why we need the state to step in and do a little bit more. 
And I'm more of an optimistic person. I know that I said that my generation gets a lot of bad news, but you kind of got to be the change that you want to see, right? And so I believe this. This is an opportunity for California to reinvent itself, where we have the combination between labor groups and other work groups from around the state come together and help out some communities that have been really impacted by oil drilling, the refineries that are in their area that have polluted their neighborhoods for years and decades, and say, hey, we want to do something better. We don't typically highlight some of the counties like Fresno County, Madera County. I'm going to even throw San Luis Obispo County in there that much. Here in the Bay Area, we take up a lot of conversations and more of those flyover counties that you hear about that you don't hear about actually need to be included in this and this is an opportunity for us to revamp our economy come on it's not like we're lacking wind it's not like we're lacking people who can jump into this workforce to help us get where where we need to be which is why i'm saying we need to be urgent with this because if two council members could have held it up held up my ordinance we wouldn't have been able to get it passed and we're just small we're just one small city the majority of the state has never heard of my city. The majority of my area has never heard of my city, which is why I'm asking the state to do more. And it's not even just for me, but it's for the next generation. It's for the generations who are here right now. I'll turn 25 in a couple of weeks in September. And so when I think about the future, it's always uncertain. It's always, I really cannot tell you what the next few years are gonna hold. And I, I wanna start a family and I know that my generation has been off to a pretty bad start in terms of equity and opportunities that other generations have received, which is why we need to step up our abilities to do what we can do better. And this is why I commend Governor Newsom what he's, on what he's done, but I know that California can continue leading the way. We don't need new oil permits because you know why, it's just a matter of time before something goes wrong. We know that if you open up one, we're gonna feel the effects through kids who have missed school because of asthma rates, kids who have to go to the emergency rooms. And let's not forget the environmental, environmental racism that has continued to plague this state for decades and decades, which is why certain neighborhoods don't have these problems and certain neighborhoods do. So I urge the folks up in Sacramento to keep doing the great work that you're doing, but we can't slow down now. As someone who is a service member and has been to some of these fires, it's kind of crazy knowing that California is always in a state where we have to be worried about this. And we have to always have basically a tentative plan to just be ready for the next fire. And it's not just isolating to some of these neighborhoods like Sonoma or Napa counties. We're seeing these fires pop up more and more. We're seeing seasons that really never change. I remember being a kid and once upon a time, California had four seasons. Now it's just spring, two days of rain and it's warm the rest of the year. This is not normal. This is something that we have to dive on. So I'm excited to see this coalition of elected officials come together and really talk about this because it's not something that we can continue to ignore or wait or push back on. So thank you again, folks. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor. And it is um, so great to see young people running for office. I'm also in Gen Z and um, we've we've grown up in basically having the climate crisis being present through our whole um, youth and adulthood, and um, obviously it can be a little bit gloomy, but it also gives us reason to be motivated to fight for our future. Um, and I'm so glad to see your passion; it gives me hope for the future. So thank you for all the work that you've been doing. And next, I want to move on to. Um, Igor Tregub, and this is someone who has been um, personally affected by the war in Ukraine and um, definitely understands how important it is for us to transition away from fossil fuels. Um, this is a global crisis, and we often talk about these issues at home, but um, he understands on a more personal level what that looks like internationally. Um, so Igor, I'll leave the stage to you. Thank you so much, Haley, and thank you to the elected officials to Protect America for hosting this press conference. Thank you to all my brothers, sisters, and siblings in arms, Dan, Alex, Marisol. Thank you for being in the fight together. This, I agree wholeheartedly with Council Member Kalb. It's unfortunate that we as current and former elected officials even have to be here uh, right now, urging the state to do more. And yet here we are. And as I have come to learn firsthand over the past 100 days, the cost 
of status quo is unacceptable. What I have experienced over that period of time, when entire neighborhoods in which I played as a child, in which my family members in Ukraine have had to hide in bunkers for weeks at a time, in which millions of my former countrymen and countrywomen have been displaced. It is absolutely related to the other existential crisis we face, the one of climate change. You see, Putin's murderous war has been financed by $285 million a day, a day from sales of Russian oil. And that is just oil. That does not include uh, other fossil fuels, including, uh, I'm just going to call it gas. Someone in the Sierra Club once told me there's nothing natural about natural gas. And I absolutely agree. We owe it to our shared humanity to act decisively today. We can help protect democratic nations that are still reliant on fossil fuels to become energy secure by showing them the way here in these United States of America and in California. Because as brother uh, Vice Mayor Walker Griffin says, I absolutely agree as goes California, so goes the nation. The leverage that Putin wields over countries that are reliant on fossil fuels are hard to overemphasize. And in addition to that, oil and gas CEOs, to a previous speaker's point, engage in the price gouging of Americans. And these executives don't care about our national security or the hardships to their customers. They care about profits. Gas is the largest source of electricity in the US and certainly in California. It's also the heating fuel that Europe depends on a belligerent Russia to supply. And of course, we know that this is a major contributor to our climate crisis. Just in the last few weeks, the actions that thousands of us within elected officials to protect America have taken, calling on the Biden administration to invoke the Defense Production Act to move as quickly as possible to invest in democratically owned, democratically controlled renewable energy have paid off when he with the power of his pen have signed this. Now there is an opportunity for California to leverage that. We can do so much more and we are doing a lot to be clear. Right now, we are leading the nation in distributed generation. Since the Million Solar Roofs Initiative was started in 2006, there have been nearly 1.5 million solar panels that, and solar arrays that have been put on roofs, garages, farms, open spaces, businesses, nonprofits. And they do it in a way that completely comports with our other conservation goals like 30 by 40, in short, setting aside 30% of our land for conservation purposes by 2030, since they don't take a lot of space. Since 2006, these customer solar systems have avoided 22 million metric tons of CO2, which is the equivalent of getting 4 million cars off the road for a year, 16,000 tons of smog pollutants, equivalent to the annual pollution of 3.8 billion cars, at least 360 trillion British thermal units of gas, equivalent to the annual consumption of 20 large natural gas fired power plants. We have avoided 5 million metric tons of carbon per year. And yet, as was pointed out earlier, CARB, the California Air Resources Board. And let me be clear, this is a staff recommendation. So there is an opportunity for the appointed members of CARB to do something different. But what staff is recommending is alternative three, 
alternative three is going to double down on the wrong part of the energy supply. It is proposing to introduce new 10 gigawatts, well, 10 gigawatts of new gas-fired generation and double down on false solutions like carbon capture and storage, which we know are prohibitively expensive, are ineffective, and frankly, that money could be better spent investing in more renewable energy faster. So on Thursday, I'm going to be joining our allies in these flyover counties. Uh, I like to call them frontline communities. We are going to be uh, at the gates of CARB and in the public hearing room, calling on our decision makers and calling on the governor to be more ambitious during this time. We already know that we have enough distributed generation to be able to take the last nuclear plant offline in 2025. We can continue to double down in renewables. We can invest in new technologies, distributed generation, as well as offshore wind power and large scale solar as well to be able to lead the way for the rest of the nation. I also had the privilege three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, um, joining Mayor Harmon, who will speak next. At the same hearing room, I'm gonna be going to again on Thursday, calling on our decision makers to ensure that by the year 2030, at least 75% and ideally 100% of all new car sales will be zero emission vehicles. And that absolutely does mean that we need to do more to ensure that that is an equitable purchase that is accessible for frontline communities. We need to double down and dramatically expand our infrastructure for electric uh, vehicle chargers um, so that everyone is able to have that access. The last thing I'm going to talk about is how about that solar? Why are we not investing in distributed generation? Unfortunately, our decision makers are actually going backwards on that question. The California Public Utilities Commission, another influential agency whose board members are also appointed by the governor, have been proposing various ways to tax rooftop solar specifically at a time when we should be doing the absolutely opposite thing. So today, there is actually an opportunity from now until 5 p.m. to call the governor's office. I'm going to give you the number and then I'm going to put it in the chat. It's 916-445-2841. Today is the summer solstice. For every 897 minutes of sunlight, that we get to enjoy today, I ask you to help lodge 897 calls to the governor. The ask is simple, no solar tax. Don't send solar off a cliff and make rooftop solar paired with storage more affordable, not less, especially for working and middle-class folks. Together, we can ensure that the voices of the communities that we serve are heard louder than the massive amounts of money that has been spent by the petro industry in California, as well as failed petro states throughout the world. As my childhood friend in Ukraine, hiding in a bunker for much of the invasion would say, make an American dream possible for Ukraine today. Thank you and Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Igor. You have a very powerful argument and offering practical solutions for uh, energy independence. 
And also thank you for giving us um, a call to action today that everyone can take. Um, and if you can, yeah, put that phone number in the chat, that would be great. Um, and calling attention to that. And next we will move to uh, the Vice President of Dublin San Ramon Water District Board, Marisol Rubio, and you can take the floor. Thank you, Haley. Um, so I want to start out just with uh, giving just some basic facts, because I think sometimes we have to remind people that there is science behind what we're saying. We're not just saying it because it's how we feel. Um, public health researchers, this is according to Harvard, Yale and Harvard studies, public health researchers are beginning to conclude that there is no safe level of air pollution. Even small doses trigger health problems. And the greater the concentration, the worse the health outcomes. All told, outdoor air pollution is among the world's greatest public health risks. In the US, air pollution kills around 100,000 people per year, which is more deaths than traffic accidents and homicides combined. Health effects from the fine particulate matter stemming from fossil fuel combustion include aggravated asthma, respiratory infections, lung cancer, heart disease, stroke, cognitive impairment, and premature death. The World Health Organization has classified smart particul small particulates as a group one carcinogen, which means there is sufficient evidence to conclude that it can it cause cancer in humans. I am a mother of a childhood brain cancer survivor, a daughter of a two-time non-Hodgkin's lymphoma survivor, the daughter of a victim of bone cancer, the ex-girlfriend of a victim of colon cancer, a cousin of someone who died from breast cancer at age 33 and left behind two young children and her husband, and a high school best friend of someone who died from brain tumor on October 1st, 2021 at the age of 47, and many more that I could list. In the US, one in two women and one in three men will develop cancer in their lifetime, which is often caused by accumulated exposure to carcinogens through a variety of pathways that all lead back to our environment and fossil fuels play a central role in that. Furthermore, a recent study found that non-Hispanic whites breathe in around 17% less air pollution than they cause by their own consumption, while Black and Hispanic people inhale more than 50% more pollution than is generated by their own actions. Therefore, environmental justice is racial justice. So to understand that the the extent to which this is really impacting us. It's affecting our land quality, that there's land degradation, water and atmospheric pollution, even as someone who serves on the water board, while you know, it doesn't impact my local district directly, it does impact areas where there are frequent wildfires. We know that these wildfires are polluting water. And while we're in a stage two drought, and the frequency of droughts are expected only to rise over time, we cannot afford to continue to have more wildfires. Um, according to drought.gov, January through March 2022 is the driest on record for these three months for much of California and Nevada. The dry end of the wet season leaves California and parts of Nevada in a third year of drought with drought conditions worse in California than a year ago, according to US Drought Monitor. Since October 2019, the beginning of the current drought, much of the region is missing over half a year's worth of normal precipitation. This should be really alarming to us because we depend on all of these things for our own existence. Labor, and the, the situation is so grave at this juncture that even labor and environmental groups have come to work together, are beginning to work in hand in hand because we understand that we cannot afford to delay anymore. Even recently, as many of you probably heard, the election in Colombia, a pro-environmental candidate and vice president won um, and they are willing to give up the export of crude oil, which makes up 50% of their country's total export. And so the minimum I feel that we've been saying as Paso as California goes leads, um, so everybody goes. Um, I think at the it's truly telling when a country like Colombia, a tiny country, has a fraction of our economy, can say, 
no thank you um, and put the environment first, this says a lot about where we're at and the urgency of now. We cannot betray our planet and we cannot betray the public. As elected officials, it is our duty to protect the public from harm, including environmental harm. And so I stand here today alongside my fellow elected officials to ask Governor Newsom to support SB 1020 to please stop issuing any permits for all fossil fuels. We must do better. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. And I'm so sorry to hear in all the ways that you've been personally affected by this, you and your family and friends. Um, and this is a huge public health crisis, an environmental crisis, um, but also a racial crisis in our country. And you can't address one without addressing all. It affects all sectors of our society. Um, and you've shown the connections between all of those um, in a very comprehensive way. And thank you for um, sharing that with us. And I want to move to last, but definitely not least, um, Heidi Harmon, who is the former mayor of San Luis Obispo. And Heidi, um, please share with us your thoughts and the work that you've done. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to start by saying a couple things. One, it's an honor to be here today with uh, electeds and others that are committed to being part of the solutions to what is clearly the defining issue of our time. You often hear that we have everything we need in terms of the technology and the understanding of how to solve this problem and what's the missing piece. It's that political will. And so it's great to see that political will growing and I am grateful to be here with all of you. And also just want to acknowledge and just, I guess, hold a space for the grief that we are all feeling. And as has been shared by some of our speakers today, some are bearing a disproportionate amount of grief. Um, this is a very big and intense issue and often that doesn't get acknowledged or named. And so I um, just want to name that. I think that's really important and people have lost and are losing their lives as we speak because of our unwillingness to do what needs to be done on this issue because we refuse as a country and as a culture and in some ways as a world to put people over profits of corporations and it's criminal frankly. You know as was noted today is the solstice. <laughs> We have everything we need to create a clean, renewable energy future that's, that centers justice and jobs. But as we speak, I think yesterday it was almost 130 degrees in Iran. Bangladesh is being flooded beyond comprehension. And the list of sorrows unfolds from there. And as we know, the millions and millions, if not billions, of climate migrants that are starting to be on the move and will continue to be on the move will be part of why the climate crisis is the biggest threat to our and global national security. Which makes it particularly frustrating that the Department of Defense is the primary user beyond like without comparison of, of user of fossil fuels. And most of these wars are resource wars mostly fossil fuel oriented. And so we cannot just address climate crisis by just talking about fossil fuels. And we cannot just address war by just talking about war, so to speak. These two things are interwoven. They go together. And that's why when I was mayor, amongst many of the things I was proud to do were divesting from both fossil fuels and the military industrial complex. Because we're really not just talking about keeping fossil fuels in the ground. We're not just talking about stepping away from extractive, destructive technologies. We're talking about stepping away from extractive, destructive ways of being with each other. I feel also really grateful to be here on the Central Coast where we do have Senator Laird as our Senator, and he does go all the way up to Santa Cruz, who is an environmental uh, leader and always has been, and, in, and is one of the lead authors on SB uh, 1020, along I believe with most or the rest of the clim new climate, Senate climate work group 
Um, and it's exciting to see that climate working group come to fruition for the first time this legislative season. And they are leading the charge on a lot of other um, and co-authoring on a lot of other critical climate legislation this year also. So I'm grateful to him. The Central Coast is sort of becoming um, really the hub of, in you know, on climate or renewable energy in particular with our potential of having um, the offshore wind technologies in Morro Bay in addition to the battery storage um, in Morro Bay. Um, we have a lot of other, we have the biggest or one of the biggest solar plants here on the solar, or solar fields on the central coast. But we also have the last operating nuclear power plant, which I recognize is controversial and people have strong feelings about keeping that going or shutting it down. But regardless of how you feel about that particular question, the reality will remain for those of us that live here on the Central Coast that we will be bearing the burden of that nuclear waste for eternity in all likelihood. Let's not forget that Diablo Canyon was built at a time when they did not realize they were building a nuclear power plant on a, a, a fault, on the edge of a cliff. Now, you might say that there's been a lot of things to, to, put, to do to create safety there, but we know that with our changing climate that we are in an unprecedented moment where we really cannot count on things being as they were. We can only count on them being as they have not been yet. So this is an incredibly potentially dangerous situation that as has been noted, we ultimately do not need to make this kind of choice if we can move swiftly and robustly towards the renewal, truly renewable energies that we need, which are still not perfect. We recognize that too. Like we also need to acknowledge that. In policy and in life, you're always gonna be exchanging one problem for another, right? There's no perfect solution. So we need to really start talking about the problems that we want to have. And sacrificing communities of color is not on the table. And sacrificing people in general is not, should not be on the table. You know, yesterday was the first national celebration of Juneteenth. And like, what are we even doing when the Air Resources Board in California, which is supposed to be this beacon of light on the environment and other progressive topics, is talking about installing more toxic methane plants I'll tell you where they're not going to be. They're not going to be in San Luis Obispo, where it is a predominantly white, affluent community. That's just so wrong on every level. And we have to do everything we can to keep that from happening. Climate crisis is the biggest threat mul multiplier we have to our safety and security on every single level. So I hope that. It's overwhelming, right? We always, people always ask me, well, what can I do? I would say, number one, start talking about the climate crisis with the people in your lives, your family, your coworkers, your friends, your constituents. Harvey Milk is one of my favorite electeds of all time. And what did he say? The only way to change policy and the culture around the way people were acting around gay rights was to come out of the closet around your own gayness in that case. And I feel like those of us that understand the depth of the problem of this issue of the climate crisis really need to come out and start talking about it more, not just in press conferences or in policy discussions, but in everyday life and start inviting people to have those conversations with us. There's a lot that we can do. And one of the very next things that you can do is as, um, Igor and others I think have mentioned, and I'll put the invitation in the chat, is join us this week on the 23rd where the Air Resources Board is meeting to talk about its draft scoping plan, which is basically the state's climate action plan. It's a blueprint for the next 20 years, okay? So we already know that depending on who you talk to or what research you look at, it's either already too late, we've had two years, we have eight years, we do not have 20 years to get our act together. We do not have 20 years to add in more extractive technologies and that's one of the things being proposed. Instead, they're doubling down on fossil fuel infrastructure at a time when we need to be phasing out fossil fuels. There should not be one more permit given out 
for fossil fuels, period. Instead, the Air Resources Board is planning for a massive, massive expansion of dirty gas-fired power plants. And again, these will not be coming to San Luis Obispo. And as was mentioned, there are not, not just the climate public health impacts, but in the more immediate term, there are huge public health impacts around these extractive technologies where they're happening. So it's incumbent upon all of us, especially those of us with privilege, take the day off. Yeah, I am saying that. Take the day off, make an effort, join us. It's that important. So this, uh, is it Wednesday? it's Thursday, we'll be meeting. There's gonna be a rally. There's gonna be a little rally in the morning, but a big rally at noon. You'll be there with other folks that you will be in relationship with, being part of joining together to end fossil fuels and really say no to them, period, and say yes to the renewable energy future that we already have. So thank you so much. And again, thank you to Senator Laird and SB 1020 and all the other great climate legislation that's coming through right now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. And I think a lot of us in this space um, share your passion and you're absolutely right that we need to take control of the narrative. And part of that is coming together with communities like Actions on the 23rd and um, speaking up for environmental justice um, and showing our elected officials that um, we do care about this issue deeply. And I wanna thank you and all of our other speakers. Your words are deeply inspiring and we admire all of the work that you've been doing and continue to do to fight the climate crisis in your own communities. Um, and now we're going to move on to the Q&A portion of our press conference. And the first question that I have for the panelists is, how will SB 1020 accelerate California's climate goals? Do any of our panelists want to jump in on that question? Well, I, I can certainly start. Um, and, you know, I want to recognize uh, this is a very ambitious bill. Um, and like any ambitious legislation, it is not perfect. Um, so I do want to acknowledge that we do have friends in the environmental and environmental justice community on both sides of this bill. But I also want to acknowledge uh, that there is a sincere desire. Uh, you know, I trust the authors of this bill, including Senator Laird, my own Senator Nancy Skinner, to continue to do the hard work that it takes to ensure that this is a bill uh, that uh, is as unanimous as it is ambitious in its support. What this bill would do, and this is the first time uh, since SB 100 was passed, another very ambitious bill that took a lot of effort to pass. Um, SB 100 um, basically said that it is going to be the policy of California to transition to 100% zero carbon energy by 2030. This bill establishes interim targets to get there because the reality is, as other speakers have pointed out, we're already behind and we cannot afford to wait one year longer, one day longer. So this bill, is going to put forward, um, put in place certain mechanisms and empower a, uh, both existing agencies and new agencies to ensure that we are on track in meeting these goals, including, for instance, uh, supplying uh, renewable energy and zero carbon resources, um, 90% of all retail sales of electricity to California by end use customers by 2035, 95% mm -hmm. by 2040. It would require state agencies to procure clean energy. Uh, it would ensure that the state water project 
which is both a major producer and consumer of electricity, that there is an accounting mechanism of how it chooses to get there. Um, it does include provisions for utility rate and bill affordability. I, I saw that in the next question, and I think that's really important to recognize as well. It proposes to establish an authority that would help reduce ratepayer costs. And it would do so uh, by ensuring that this is a nonprofit public benefit corporation. Because what's going on now is we have investor owned utilities. We have three of them in the state uh, that are basically monopolies. And we have already seen uh, rate hikes of as much as 20% in some service areas. And that is simply unacceptable. It leaves the most vulnerable among us behind. It puts millions of Californians in that situation where they have to choose between uh, paying their rent and paying their utility bill, frankly, or paying, paying their mortgage um, if they happen to have a home but are house rich but cash poor. Uh, this would ensure that you know, it's the nonprofit status of that corporation that would provide the necessary regulation to reduce and hopefully eliminate price gouging um, and have the power to do things that the current California Public Utilities Commission and other agencies simply don't have the power to do. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Igor, and you even um, got to our next question as well in there, which is great. Um, and just for context for our audience, um, that question was um, asking about how SB 1020 um, will be creating jobs and um, addressing the potential cost to ratepayers, and also how it will benefit low to moderate income communities already suffering from inflation. And I also want to highlight um, that the bill does require that um, CARB meetings will be happening in parts of California that are most affected um, by air pollution. So it also has addressed um, which stakeholders will be able to participate in those meetings and they're the ones who are most affected by these issues. Um, do any other panelists want to add in on either of those questions before we move on? Okay, um, well, our next question uh, is, Calif or, uh, sorry, Governor Newsom has already said that he will get rid of fracking in California by 2024. So in light of this, what is the importance of asking him to stop permitting, stop permitting the construction of uh, any new wells in the state? So if any of our panelists feel free to jump in if you feel inclined to answer this question. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, you know, the importance is it's a lot easier to wean off something if you have some if you have a hard cut off on something, you know, and then that creates less of an opportunity for people to say, well, we just got the moment of going, you're killing jobs, you know, so if you don't have any permits and that, that allows you to give yourself an adjustment period to start phasing out of it. And then just bring in those new stakeholders who can have new conversations about having a new opportunity out there. But again, the big thing about it is, is if you don't have anything new, then that gives someone less of a justification to say, why are you trying to uh, hurt the jobs around here? Or why are you trying to cut energy independence? Some of the more rhetoric you hear from more conservative groups. Great, yeah, thank you. That's that's absolutely right. Um, and Marisol, did you wanna add something as well? Yes, I think it goes back to what um, the former mayor uh, Heidi Harmon was mentioning. It's also about keeping that conversation going, uh, continue to apply that pressure and let our electeds know that this is at the forefront of our thoughts and, and concerns. Um, and <clears throat> I think there was a question kind of related to what can we really do in, in terms of um, as well, like I think it's also important to let elected like know that the public is staying attuned to this, that we are paying attention, and that yes, 
elections matter. I mean, I, I don't mean to go back on this again, just what happened, you know, the other day on Sunday, you know, what that tells in another country, what that tells us is that the voters have the power. The voters at the end of the day decide who gets to represent them. So um, I think in every way that possible, the more we can message that out and bring it to the forefront, the better. Yeah, I think a lot of people forgot that they have agency. It is so overwhelming right now, right? I, I think it would be fair to argue that there's never been a more overwhelming time in the history of the world to be alive. Um, and you still, we still have agency. And in a way, for me anyway, you know, I've got two kids. That's what this is about for me. And climate crisis puts me and the world in a position of having nothing left to lose. Like, what are we waiting for? It's a very powerful place to be. I think especially for women and anyone else who has been in a traditionally marginalized group, um, there's a lot of cultural reasons that we all probably understand why sometimes we don't speak or do things or, or claim our agency, especially in a public space. And for me, I see the climate crisis is bringing out a lot of folks that have not traditionally been heard or felt comfortable voicing their concerns. And it's in a way really powerful because what's the alternative of not engaging? I put in the chat in an answer to somebody's question um, that we need to remember that, that we have agency. Yes, they have money. Of course, the fossil fuel has more money than anyone in the history of the world. Um, but we have more people and we are on the right side of history and we are on the right side of life itself. We are in, alignment with life itself, right? So don't forget that. And they will never have more power than we do, but we are not accessing that power. And that is a huge missed opportunity. And so I just wanna remind people that cynicism serves the status quo. So when we get on Twitter or wherever and say, it's too late, it's hopeless, my voice doesn't matter, I'm not even gonna vote, blah, 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 all that stuff. What you are doing is voting for the status quo, which the status quo is not voting for you. So don't forget that we have agency. They want you to give up. They want you to give up. Absolutely, there is power in numbers for sure. Um, and thank you, Heidi, for answering those uh, questions in the chat as well. You helped us to um, get to hopefully anyone that did have a question for the panelists. Um, and I, again, want to thank all of you for joining us and showing us um, how imperative it is to transition to a, a renewable energy future and showing us how we can actually achieve that goal like all of you are doing. Um, and we all know we're in a climate emergency. We're seeing heat waves, droughts, wildfires, um, environmental justice issues, all while gas prices are rising across the country and definitely in California as well. And that's why our national security depends on phasing out fossil fuels. Um, SB 20, SB 1020, sorry, um, will set California up to reach those climate goals. And a few of our speakers touched on uh, just how much that bill will do to accelerate our progress towards the lofty goals that California has set to try to be a world leader um, for climate policy. And elected officials to protect America, California has over 430 elected officials who signed on to call on Governor Newsom to phase out oil and gas and also improve setback restrictions on oil and gas wells. And at the national level, over 500 elected officials have signed on, um, calling on President Biden to um, invoke the Defense Production Act to invest in renewable energy and also declare a national climate emergency um, as we are in a crisis and it needs to be treated as such. So we appreciate all the work that has been done, but there's um, a long way to go as well. And I also want to thank all our press that was here today um, asking questions and listening. And if you do have any questions after this, you can get in contact with our communications director, uh, Ramona Dehu, 
and her email is ramona at protectingamerica.net. And we will release a short video um, of this press conference in the press release. So watch out for that. Um, and with that, that concludes our press conference.